Hello, and I'm really excited to be presenting this first video in my Shorts in Biology series. In this video, I'll be going through the requirements for each section of a Stage 2 Biology Investigation Report for the South Australian Certificate of Education. Therefore, we'll be referencing the SACE assessment design criteria throughout the video. However, if you're not a SACE Biology student, then don't despair as the sections of the report and content within are pretty universal in any biology and general science curriculum. So let's get started. Investigation report needs to have the following six sections, introduction, materials and method, results, discussion, conclusion, and a bibliography. In stage two biology, your length is either 1500 words if written or 10 minutes if an oral presentation. Please note as well that if you choose oral presentation, this can be pre-recorded. You don't have to perform this in front of the class. When written, the word count only applies to the following sections, the introduction, the discussion, and the conclusion. Let's have a look at what needs to be included in each of these sections. The aim of the introduction is to introduce the theory behind the practical and the specific feature generally being assessed here is knowledge and application one. Demonstration of knowledge and understanding of biological concepts. The introduction contains the following key elements. Background biology, aim, hypothesis, identification and classification of variables, identification of factors which can't be controlled, and identification of the control group or groups present. It's also crucial to ensure throughout the report that you use proper scientific conventions. We'll now deep dive into each of these key elements, examining what to cover and looking at an exemplar. Before launching into the details of your investigation, it's important to provide a context. Therefore, you need to provide some background biology so that the reader can understand exactly what and why you conducted your investigation. You also need this information again later in the discussion. For example, for an investigation into factors affecting enzyme activity in laundry detergent, a student may provide an overview of what enzymes are and their biological significance, as well as an explanation of how they work and factors that affect them. The student would then need to provide an overview of some of the enzymes present in laundry detergent and reasons for their inclusion in the detergent. It's important to keep your background biology concise and relevant using references where appropriate. After providing some background biology, you need to state your aim, which is a short statement about what you're trying to find out. So if we stick with the laundry detergent example, the aim might be to determine the effect of temperature on the activity of proteases found in washing powder. Next comes the hypothesis. Your hypothesis needs to link the independent and dependent variables and make a clear prediction. It can be helpful to write the hypothesis as an if-then statement. For example, if the temperature of the water is at 50 degrees Celsius, then protease will have the greatest level of activity, with the highest percentage of light transmitted through the stain material. Notice here that the student hasn't only identified the independent and dependent variables, but has also stated how the dependent variable is being measured. Again, make sure you're using proper scientific conventions. This includes not using any personal pronouns, so no writing, I guess X will happen as a hypothesis. Keep it formal and impersonal. The next step is to identify and classify variables. Start with the independent variable, which is what is being deliberately manipulated during the experiment. It is whatever you are investigating the effect of. The dependent variable is what was measured and is the variable that you expect to change as the independent variable changes. So for our earlier example, what was deliberately manipulated was temperature. So that is the independent variable. What was measured was protease activity, and we would expect this to change as temperature changes, hence protease activity is the dependent variable. The other type of variable that you need to identify are the controlled variables. These are factors that need to remain constant as they may also influence the dependent variable. Include a brief explanation of how they will be controlled and why they must be kept constant. In other words, how may it influence the results if not controlled? If we return to our example, 
some of the other factors that may influence protease activity and therefore need to remain constant include pH, the concentration of both substrate and enzyme, the volume of detergent solution, and time the reaction is allowed to proceed for. As well as controlled variables, there will be other factors that may affect the data that are unable to be controlled. These also need to be considered in the introduction. Part of this is also explaining why they can't be controlled and how they may affect the data. Here is an example. You can see here that you don't need to go into a lot of detail. Remember, you only have 1500 words, but this student has successfully demonstrated an, an awareness of factors that can't be controlled and their effect on the data. As the section title suggests, it is in this part of the report that you list the materials required and the method followed. You also need to include a safety and risk assessment and a labelled diagram of the apparatus where appropriate. In the safety and risk assessment, you need to state the potential hazards of your practical. Outline any potential harm it could cause and how you will manage the hazard, including any control measures that will be taken. If applicable, you may also need to consider any ethical considerations. The simplest and most concise way to present your safety and risk assessment is in a table format such as this one. As well as listing all of the chemicals used, make sure you include quantities. When listing equipment, also be as specific as possible. So for example, rather than simply writing beaker, include the size such as 250 ml beaker. Here is an example of a materials list with all the quantities specified. Your method is a step-by-step -step list of what was done and needs to be detailed and specific enough to enable someone else to replicate your investigation exactly. Therefore, include specific quantities here as well. Part of this method is a description of exactly how the independent variable was changed and the dependent variable measured. As you have already completed the investigation at the time of writing, the method needs to also be written in past tense. Here is an exemplar method. You can see that each step is concise yet specific and written in past tense. Another important element to point out is that if you are starting a sentence with a number, you need to write the, the word for the number, not just the number. So four pieces of, not the number four and then pieces of. Your diagram of apparatus can be hand drawn, electronic or a labelled photograph. Just make sure that it is clear and showing all of the important components and of course, make sure it's labelled. The next section is the results. This section doesn't contain any interpretation or evaluation, but is simply a summary of the data. This includes data tables and graphs. You may also wish to include labelled photos to aid in your discussion, but this is purely optional and only do this if it adds value to your report. It is also important to ensure that you represent both the individual and class data in your results section. Let's look at the appropriate conventions for tabulation and graphing in more detail. Make sure all tables use a proper row and column structure and contain a column for the average. Remember too that units only belong in the heading of each column and not in each individual cell. It's also important to be consistent with the number of significant figures used. Graphs need to have a descriptive title that clearly connects the independent and dependent variables. The reader should be able to understand what they are seeing in your graph without having to read other sections of the report. So a vague title such as enzyme practical is inadequate. Plot the independent variable on the X axis with the dependent variable on the Y. You also need to ensure that both axes have even scales and are appropriately labelled, including units in brackets. Make sure you're also using the appropriate graph type for your data. Generally, this will be a line graph such as the example shown here. Be careful when graphing in Excel, as often the default settings, including scales and plot type, will be incorrect. You also want to ensure that the plotted points are clearly shown as well as the line or curve as shown in this example.
The discussion is the most important part of your report and should be the majority of your word count. It contains an explanation and interpretation related to the relevant key knowledge and skills. There are two main parts to the discussion as per the assessment design criteria. The analysis and interpretation of data and evaluation of procedures and their effect on data. Let's look at each of these components and what needs to be discussed within them in more detail. In the analysis and interpretation part of the discussion, you need to describe patterns found in the results. This should include specific values of interest and specific trends in the data. It is really important to be logical and critical here, rather than just describing what the data table and graphs show. Make sure your conclusions are clearly justified based on the data you have collected. After describing your data, you need to link it to the hypothesis. Was it supported or disproved? And therefore, was the question answered? Explain why this was so. The next part is to explain your results in relation to the biological background in your introduction. Use this information to interpret what your results mean on a biological level. You will need to use references here. Lastly, include an explanation of the results of any controlled data. How is this important? And what does it tell you about your experiment? Here is an example of this part of the discussion. The student begins by describing patterns found in their data and gives specific values. For example, at 30 degrees, the average light transmitted was 9%, signifying that the stain material was very dark. At 50 degrees, the intensity increased to 20%, with the light sensor of the EV3 robot detecting more light. The student then goes on to explain the controlled data, which enables them to conclude that due to the lack of difference between the controlled data and test data, protease activity was not the cause of stain removal. Finally, the student explains these results using relevant biological concepts. They discuss the effect of temperature on stain removal as opposed to enzyme activity. The only thing missing from this exemplar is a link to the hypothesis. Make sure you don't forget to include this in this section as well. The second part of the discussion is where the procedures are evaluated, including their effect on the data. This involves evaluating the experimental method and identifying sources of uncertainty. In your report, you need to identify two sources of random error and one systematic error. You also need to make sure that you explain their effect on the data. Just identifying errors or merely stating that they will affect the data without explaining how is not enough. Also, you shouldn't be discussing things like running out of time, making mistakes reading measurements or dropping equipment. After identifying sources of error, suggest improvements to the method. Why and how will it improve the results? Embedded within your evaluation of the procedure and discussion of errors, you also need to discuss the data's reliability, precision, accuracy and validity. Here is an example where the student has discussed errors and improvements in an integrated fashion. This is often a good approach to avoid repetition and conserve word count. The student has begun the paragraph by identifying what the source and type of error is. The water bath is a source of systematic error. They then proceed to explain how the data supports the fact that this systematic error is present. The water bath temperature fluctuated from 68.9 to 70.1 degrees. The student then proceeds to link this both to accuracy as it is a systematic error and validity. Again, they're providing reasons for their conclusions. An improvement to address this source of error is then suggested, including an explanation of why and how it will improve the results. Recalibrating the water bath will increase its accuracy and therefore the validity of the results as the temperature recorded will be the one actually tested. The random error example. Again, the student begins by identifying the source and type of error. This is then followed by an explanation of how the data indicates the presence of random error. They refer to scatter within the results, providing specific values. This naturally leads into a discussion of the data's precision and reliability. And finally, like last time, the student finishes the paragraph by suggesting an improvement and explaining how and why it will improve the results.
It's important that the conclusion be supported by evidence and based on results that can be repeated. It is a simple statement of findings of the investigation which answers the aim. It isn't another big paragraph. You aren't restating all of your main discussion points here. Therefore, you might like to start with the phrase, it was found that. You also need to recognise the limitations of your results. Here is a student example. You can see that this conclusion consists of only three sentences. Again, this section should be very concise. It is simply stating what the findings were and recognising the limitations of results. It is important to acknowledge any sources used in a bibliography section. Do this using the Harvard referencing system. Whilst writing your report, make sure that you are only using credible sources such as textbooks, journal articles and credible websites. This does not include those such as Wikipedia. My final reminder is about communication. Make sure that you are effectively using scientific communication throughout your report. It should be clear, concise and thus easy to read and understand. Read it out loud or to a friend or family member to help you improve your expression and clarity. Check that you are using appropriate formal language and are writing in third person. No personal pronouns like I or we should be anywhere in your report. Are you using the correct biological terms? Are you being specific? For example, rather than talking about the enzyme, use its name. If you're investigating the effect of temperature on protease, say the name protease. Check also that you are correctly using conventions, including units and significant figures. This assessment design criteria is dedicated to assessing your communication throughout the report. So allow plenty of time to do this when writing. You shouldn't be just investing time and energy into the content, but also into how you're delivering the content. I hope this video has been helpful and that the requirements of each section of the report are very clear. Happy report writing!